Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Wyndham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Wyndham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. He's a longtime critic of the Connecticut Port Authority and their state peer project in New London. We talk with Kevin Blacker, activist and now candidate for the Green Party, challenging Joe Courtney for his seat in the upcoming elections. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Kevin Blacker is a Noank resident and came to people's attention when he started fighting the Connecticut Port Authority over their state peer project in New London. He's continued that activism for four years now, and with the November 8th elections just days away, Blacker is on the ballot for the second congressional district as a candidate for the Green Party, set to challenge incumbent Joe Courtney for his seat. Blacker has been denied the ability to debate Courtney and Republican candidate Mike France by some organisations, but Connecticut East this week and a few other independent media organisations are willing to provide you, the voting public, the information you need to make your decision when you go to the polls soon. I sat down with Kevin Blacker recently for a candid chat about who he is, why he's running and what his chances are. Kevin, you've been on the podcast before talking about various issues, and one of those issues we will be talking to you about in this interview. But we're talking to you today because you are the Green Party representative for the second congressional district. And of course, very soon we are going to be having those elections. Talk to us a little bit about who is Kevin Blacker, because we've never really like delved into your background before. Well, I'm 36 years old. I live in Noank. I've lived most of my entire life here in Noank, which is a section of Groton. Came from a family of five, have a brother and sister, worked with my father my whole life, uh, went to college for four years, got a degree in soil science, you know, predominantly make my living mowing lawns, also do a fair amount of farming, cutting and selling hay. So tell us, the Green Party had been obviously looking at you. You've been quite vocal on some issues. And like I said, we're going to get onto one of those particular issues a little bit later in the interview. And they came to you and said, hey, we're looking for a candidate to put on the ballot to keep our ballot line there. But also, you know, as somebody who they clearly thought has got what it takes to maybe challenge in the second congressional district, uh, which is Joe Courtney's district. What did you think when they came to you? Well, I was a little intimidated, a little uncertain, you know, at the thought of doing something that was so public or the pressure around it. But I also could clearly see the opportunity. I try to never let fear stop me from doing something that is going to be overall good. So, you know, I I was interested. And I think they, the three ladies that came, uh, Rana Stuller, Frida Berrigan, Myrna Martinez, I think highly of them as people. And, you know, I saw the opportunity to help them in the Green Party and help myself, you know, in this work I've been doing at State Pier. You've been very specific, as you are in everything that you do with the Green Party, about how you were intending to run your campaign, what you were and were not prepared to do. Talk to us a little bit about that, because it's very different to how probably everybody else runs their campaigns. Yes. So I wanted to be honest with them about there would be limits to what I was, you know, willing to give to the campaign. There were certain things I wouldn't compromise on. Like I I wasn't, you know, most one of the most important things, I wasn't going to take any money from anybody. I wasn't going to take any donations. I don't want to be beholden to anybody. That's just a principle of my life. So there was that there was a limit to the time I was going to be able to devote campaigning. I wanted to be clear about that. I, I have to work. I have family that, that relies on me as well as multiple jobs. So, you know, I was upfront about that. I think, you know, it was just tried to be honest with, look, I'll do this, but 
as long as you guys are okay with me doing these things. I, I told them I didn't want to join the Green Party. That, that, again, is about maintaining my independence and not being beholden to anybody. So, interestingly, of course, they chose you. I say interestingly. I mean, there's, uh, that perhaps that's a bad choice of words. But, you know, you were nominated, and, and it was a good nomination. I mean, and then, of course, the debates came up, and trouble started brewing again because it sort of seemed to show I don't know if cracks is the word but sort of like maybe how democracy in this country is engineered in a certain way because you were denied the opportunity despite being a legitimate candidate with your name on a ballot for a legitimate party in this state you were denied the opportunity to debate with joe courtney and and mike france at an event i believe at eastern connecticut state university which was i think one of the first second congressional so like debates which was organized by the league of women voters talk to us about that because Clearly, you were very unhappy about that, and rightfully so. Like you said, the system is engineered to encourage the two-party system with money and power and and discourage other independent ideas. It's not the way it's supposed to be. That's That's not the American way. And I believe that if you're on the ballot, you should be allowed to have access to the voters and and debate. It's been going on for a long time. I know that Oz Griebel, who I was an Argent supporter of, and Monty Frank, when they ran for governor in 2018, they were excluded from the debates in a similar way. And it's just, it's a disservice to the voters, and it's unfair to the candidate. You know, those, if Mike France and Joe Courtney get to get up there and practice... So then I face them and they've already had one debate and had a chance to practice and I go up and it's my first time. And I think the two party system is really flawed. It doesn't reflect it's the two extremes. And I think that most people in the country are somewhere more in the middle. Do you also think as well that to a certain degree, things like the media, I mean, you know, I'm a member of the media, but, you know, the media industry, also organizations like the League of Women Voters have too much power. I mean, they shouldn't be able to just censor effectively the candidates in that sort of way. I mean, I do understand that often there are multiple candidates. And of course, if you're not on the ballot, they can't have everybody. I mean, we would probably have like debates with, you know, lots and lots of candidates. So I I sort of do understand the need to try and bring them down in number. But when you are a legitimate candidate yep. on you know, a ballot paper with a legitimate organization, it comes across as a form of censorship. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that the, the media, let me think of how to differentiate because you're a member of the media, but you have integrity. And there are members of the media like Greg Stroud or David Collins or Sten Spinella that have integrity and try to find the truth. There are other members of the media that use their position of power to try to influence. I think that you've seen a real shift in the media in terms of not respecting the role, the service that the media is supposed to provide in the American system. I don't know how the League of Women Voters justifies denying somebody that is on the ballot access to debate. They can't, I guess their their argument was, well, I'm not a viable candidate, but that's not their decision to make. That's the decision of the voters. And it was the same, Oz Griebel and Monty Frank, they were on the ballot and, and they were excluded. And so this has been ongoing for a long time. I, I knew that I was in this position that if I fought really aggressively, it likely wouldn't make a difference for me. But in two years or four years, they'll think twice I made it uncomfortable enough for them that they'll think twice about excluding the next guy or girl. Let me put this question to you. It's a bit of a wide open question, but, you know, we're seeing lots of disruption in the political, so like environment all across this country. Some of it not necessarily, you know, what we would like to see. I mean, obviously, we saw January 6th, the insurrection there. I mean, an extreme example of people's action, not necessarily, you know, something that everybody agrees with. But do you think people have got to a point with the politics and the political parties in this country that they're basically trying to say we've had enough and we want to see things change? Yeah, I believe that most people are very frustrated and fed up. The thing is that you've got two choices. One, 
way over to one side, one way over to the other side, and both of them are running in, in their own directions farther and farther apart and polarizing things even more. And I think that the average person, they can agree on honesty, kindness, good judgment, making decisions that don't have over uh, an over amount of bad financial impact. And I think it's almost like the politicians have become these WWF wrestling characters. And I think a regular person could do a really good job at getting some unity, you know, getting things that people could agree on. And of course, also, we're not seeing the full width and breadth, as it were, of people wishing to be candidates, because not only were, as we said, you would deny the opportunity to be at a debate. Um, there is actually a libertarian who's um, on the ballot, legitimately again on the ballot for the second congressional district. Admittedly, you were saying before we started this interview that there's like a placeholder. But despite that, again, we've heard nothing of that individual. And I'm sure this is happening across the state here in Connecticut and across the nation where we're seeing uh, people like yourself being that denied that opportunity to be part of the democratic process when it comes to the debates. Yeah, absolutely. William Hall, the libertarian candidate, he came and stood with us in the rain outside of Eastern in Willimantic where we were not allowed to debate. Or, and, uh, you know, he, he was there and uh, also he was locked out as well. Let's talk about the two people that you're sort of up against. One in particular, obviously, the incumbent, uh, Joe Courtney. And then, of course, we have the Republican, Mike France. Give us your thoughts on both of the candidates. Let's start with Joe. I mean, he's been in. He's seeking, I believe, his ninth term if he succeeds. So uh, thoughts on the two other candidates? I think Joe's a good guy, but he's getting old. He's getting tired. He's lacking. His courage is waning. And... I think he's highly partisan. I think he's he's very, very partisan. He talks about bipartisanship, but I think when it comes down to it, he's just Democrat all the way. And I lost a tremendous amount of respect for him in regards to state peer. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I lost a tremendous amount of respect for him. I had always voted for him. And o over the years that this state peer debacle has been going on, I stopped voting for him. I lost that much respect for him. Mike France, I really don't know that very much about him. I think that he is a, just your traditional kind of generic Republican. I think he's also, I don't see any chance of him getting elected. I, I, I read the examiner's poll, and it was something like 70% of the people in Connecticut that they, po that they polled, in, you know, in, in the second district didn't even know who he was. And I, I think that there is quite a stigma around voting Republican. I think that I don't think he's going to overcome that stigma. I think he's a good person, but he's just not, he just doesn't have the charisma or the energy to upset somebody like Joe Courtney, who is so well entrenched. What's also been interesting as well, this political cycle, is that Republicans and, and some Democrats as well have sort of refused to actually debate and uh, it's gone down to just these forums. What have been your thoughts about that? Because as we said, you would deny the opportunity to debate and then we hear about some of the candidates from the two parties saying, yeah, we don't actually want to debate. Uh, cowards. You gotta, if, if you're offered or asked to debate, I think that you have a responsibility. You, you really owe it to people to get up there. And now that's, like you said, that's that's Republicans and Democrats. People deserve to hear from you and see you get up there. And yeah, candidates should be jumping at the opportunity to get up on stage or, or get up in front of people and, you know, have questions live fired at them. Let's get on to the big subject, which we've spoken to you in previous podcasts about. And I think it's fair to say uh, brought you to prominence, not only to people like myself and the rest of the press, but to the public as well. And that is the situation at State Pier in New London and uh, the redevelopment of State Pier. It continues to be controversial. Talk to us a little bit about it. Well, prices keep going up and it keeps getting delayed, just like we've said for four years. It's been four years you and I have been talking. I mean, I remember when you first started coming down, we were mowing lawns and, and uh, you, you know, you, and you came and talked and it's still going. We're still fighting. They're still not done. They still don't have a, gr a, a gross maximum price locked in. They, they're still the 
FBI investigations, the Attorney General investigations, the Contracting Standards Board had said has said that they believe the deal is illegal. Uh, an employee was just fined by the Ethics Commission for taking an illegal gift, which I would call a bribe. A contractor was fined significantly for giving those illegal gifts. I think as soon as the election is over, you're going to see a tremendous amount of action. I think they've got a, a dam holding back a bunch of information. And once the election goes by, there's going to be, we'll get some information on what's going on with the federal investigations and the state investigations. But I believe very, very firmly that the work myself and some others have done, the, the press has done digging, that we're going to get the truth. And when the truth comes out, it's going to have a, a really serious impact on the political landscape of Connecticut. Talking of members of the press, um, all of this started with a certain Dave Collins, opinion writer and journalist at The Day newspaper, but also yourself as well. Both of you really have been very vocal about the situation surrounding state here and the Connecticut Port Authority's involvement in that. Now, interestingly, uh, and just recently, Dave Collins wrote in one of his columns that he is going to vote for you. How did you feel about that when you read it? Very nice. Uh, real, a real compliment. David Collins, uh, w- without his reporting, I would have been sunk. I, s- I say that all the time. I would have been completely just uh, rolled over by a very mean and dishonest political machine He recognized what was happening and he he stood right there and and he deflected it. And and that's that's what the that's what the newspaper, the the newspaper is the equalizer, it's the protector of the public. It's it allows any person that has the truth and courage to go up against anybody, regardless of how powerful or how much more money they have. And I, I would have been sunk without the free press without David Collins, especially, but you know, yourself found, you know, you were the one that found the state was overcharging me. You know, I would have had, I would have been facing felony charges. You know, they would have stuck me with a felony, but you member of the press dug out that they had grossly overestimated the, the cost. So there, there's been a number of times that people in the press have made the difference by digging out the truth. The truth is a shield, you know, that I've always tried to stay behind. Let me put this question to you. We're days away now from the actual election itself. Thoughts on how you think it's going to go? And if you shouldn't make it this time by way of defeating the incumbent? Is it uh, something that you would possibly look at doing again if you're asked to run again? Well, I am going forward. I'm trying to have no expectations. I know that I, I'm positive that I could win. I am also very aware that the likelihood of that happening, the chances are very slim. But anything is possible. And it's like the Super Bowl 51 with Tom Brady when they were down and everybody thought it was over and the lady was in her red dress dancing on the field. And, you know, the owners of the other team's, uh, you know, girlfriend or wife. And everything changed in the last in the last minutes of the game. So the same thing could happen here. I always I, I always keep hope. Should I not win... Would I run for Congress again? I'd like not to. I would really like not to. You just want to see people do their jobs and actually do it for the people, not for the prestige of being somebody who's in political power. Yeah, I think that government should be a service. It should be an American service to, that, that you do because you love the country and you love the town and you love the state and you love the district and you love all your friends and you love everybody and you just want to do good. And... and that you shouldn't be serving a party and these businesses and these donors that you should be trying to do what is absolutely best, that you should try to do things the best way they can possibly be done to help the most people. And that's why I'm running and hoping in the same way that Oz Griebel inspired me, he was influential. He he was just, he, he was an incredible person and his actions made an impact on me. And if nothing else, I hope that my actions encourage somebody else next election. Well, whatever the outcome, Kevin Blacker, nominee for the Green Party for the second congressional district here in Connecticut. Uh, As I say, whatever the outcome at the election, we know that we will hear from you and continue to hear from you as you fight the good fight. But uh, we wish you the best of success, of course, at the upcoming election. And as always, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. (music) 
You took the first step and quit smoking, but even former smokers may still be at risk for lung cancer. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know about a new low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early. It takes only 60 seconds and could save your life. You took the first step, now take the next. Visit SaveByTheScan.org for a simple quiz to see if you're eligible and talk to your doctor about screening. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Green Valley Tree LLC is proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week. Contact Green Valley Tree LLC for all your tree removal and plant health care needs and more. Find us at GreenValleyTreeWorks.com or call 860-234-4041. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week. Local and state agencies, academic institutions and legislators came together recently to look back at Superstorm Sandy 10 years on to highlight progress and future challenges in climate resiliency in the state. The event was held at Yukon's Avery Point campus in Groton. Newly appointed Yukon President Radenka Marek sent a video message to the attendees saying how the university has created new departments and research since the storm in 2012 and those efforts will be ongoing. We have over 230 faculty at Yukon whose educational and research focus on the climate change, environment, clean energy, human rights related to climate change is going to change the lives. Because of this work, and the work of so many others, the state of Connecticut is in the better position today than it was 10 years ago. Katie Dykes, Commissioner of Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, DEEP was one of the key speakers and said that with the widespread power outages at the time, they quickly learned about the need for smaller, more robust microgrids. We were the first state to have a statewide microgrids grant program, really reflecting a lot of those challenges that we saw of communities not having access to critical facilities with power that could provide for critical services for folks while they were waiting to have their power restored. And since we launched that program, we have 12 functioning microgrids across the state. The conference also heard from state agencies about projects still being completed, as well as new infrastructure improvements to be carried out in Bridgeport and New Haven to help reduce flooding risks due to climate change. Superstorm Sandy is the largest Atlantic hurricane on record measured in size that had storm force winds spanning over 1,000 miles. When it hit Connecticut, over 650,000 people lost power for several days and five people were killed. Access Health Connecticut, the state's official health insurance marketplace, is expanding their Navigator partner locations to areas of the state they know are underinsured as they open enrollment for health insurance for 2023. James Michelle is the CEO of Access Health CT and said the non-profit health provider United Community and Family Services, UCFS, based in Norwich, has become their newest partner location. We know in the southeast corner of the state, there's a growing uninsured population, especially those who you work in the casinos. Casinos have been laying people off. They may get other jobs, but paying less money, but they don't qualify for Medicaid. So we want to make sure we are here to let them know that they have options available to them to maintain their health and them and their family's health. Local residents can call or visit UCFS and discuss their health insurance needs with Access Health staff right up until January 15th of 2023, the cutoff date to get health insurance. Michelle also said they've recently completed training new insurance brokers to help people get insurance in underinsured areas of the state as well. We have 30 new brokers in those three communities that live in those communities that look at the people who live there. We hope that that just having access to that knowledgeable resource is going to help improve access to health care and also extension to the quality of health for people who live there because they will have access to information as well as access to health care. The three communities covered by the new brokers are Hartford, Bridgeport and New Haven, which a recent Access Health CT study showed have the greatest health disparities in the state. They can also find out whether they are eligible for reduced price or even free health insurance based on their income levels and subsidies from the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA and the recent Inflation Reduction Act. Access Health is also celebrating 10 years this year providing health insurance advice to Connecticut residents. November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month and long-time smokers in Connecticut at increased risk of developing lung cancer now have access to innovative low-dose CT scans that could significantly increase their survival rate from the disease. 
Dr. Louis Mazzarelli is the director of lung cancer screening at LM Hospital, part of Yale New Haven Health, and says using this technology and screening patients sooner is the key to catching the disease in its early stages. Those CT scans allow us to see things that we couldn't see before. Years ago, we would use chest x rays to screen for lung cancer, but that wasn't very effective. And large studies suggested that there was a better way to do it, and that way was with lung screening CT scans, where patients have the ability to just come to the hospital in a matter of 20 seconds and have a scan that looks at their lungs to assess for lung cancer. Mazzarelli says using this technology can also help identify other possible health issues as well. The other thing that I would tell patients is that beyond what we find and our primary goal is that we're finding lung cancer, but we look at the entire body that we image, and that includes the heart, it includes the bones, it includes the lungs, and all the soft tissues adjacent to it. So it's not uncommon that this modality allows us to not only identify lung cancer, but emphysema, cardiac disease, other incidental findings that could positively impact a patient's life. Lung cancer Cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths for both men and women. Each year, more people die of lung cancer than colon, breast and prostate cancers combined. That's according to the American Cancer Society. Detecting lung cancer early can increase survival rates from 6% to 56% with early treatment. Patients can receive the screenings only with a request by their primary care physician and health insurance does cover the low-dose CT scans. The Connecticut National Guard broke ground on a new armory or readiness centre in Putnam recently, marking a return to the quiet corner for the first time in 15 years. The new centre will be the home of the 643rd Military Police Company and will provide them with a state-of-the-art facility for training and recruitment. They are currently based at an outdated armory in Westbrook that no longer meets anti-terrorism and force protection standards. Major General Francis Yvonne, the Adjutant General of the Connecticut National Guard, said the new centre will be a symbol in the local community. So our job as the Guard is to show the neighbours, our neighbours, the benefit of service, educate them on what we do, what our values are, and the opportunities that we offer. And this $26 million readiness centre is critical to our end state in building readiness to support the future fight and support our citizens when called upon. U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal was among the guests at the groundbreaking and said the National Guard used to be known as the stepchild to the military, but conflicts around the world have shown otherwise. We know from these past 20 years that it is a full-fledged, absolutely critical element of our military readiness and defense. And it has been in every part of the world, in every fight, doing everything that the other services have done. The National Guard are a branch of the Army and can quickly respond and meet the demands of an emergency, particularly during severe weather events like hurricanes and storms, as well as other natural disasters. The new centre is expected to open in 2025 and now gives the National Guard a presence in seven of the state's eight counties. And Amtrak has announced they are looking to select a contractor for the construction and design of a new Connecticut River bridge in East Lyme. The current bridge, built back in 1907, is located on the Amtrak Northeast Corridor train route, one of the busiest routes in the country, and sits between the towns of Old Saybrook and Old Lyme, carrying Amtrak and Shoreline East passenger trains as well as freight. The bridge has come to the end of its useful life and requires frequent repairs and maintenance to keep it working to avoid train delays and has been a bottleneck for years as trains have to cross it at greatly reduced speed because of its age and condition. It's all part of a more than $500 million investment from Amtrak, the Connecticut Department of Transportation and the Federal Railroad Administration after years of underinvestment in the rail transportation system. Amtrak expects to award the contract in late 20. 2023, with construction of the new bridge starting in 2024. That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at connecticut-east.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East This Week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. I'm Brian Scott Smith. Thank you for listening.